Here in Devon, in the tranquil Tamar Valley, is a port that once bustled with industry. Now Morwellum Quay has been brought back to life, as it would have been during the reign of King Edward VII. Archaeologists Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn and historian Ruth Goodman are living the lives of Edwardian farmers for a full calendar year. So far, they've started their arable concern by making lime fertilizer and attempted to plow using the latest Edwardian technology. I think you could do with a push. They've taken in livestock and ventured into market gardening and fishing. Now it's January and the team turned their hands to industries that once brought wealth to Devon. Mining. No, I think we learnt one thing. Never grumble about farming again. Yeah. <laughs> and lace making. I'm watching you. Because you won't earn your money. If you're, I'm never going to earn any money at this if rate. you're um, not practising. But will they be able to master them? Let's go. Yeah, there we go. And win the race against time to get their crops sown. What sale? Drink, Drink hail. hail! You just scared away evil from it. <laughs> Fixed. In Devon, it's been the harshest of winters. That's it, steady. It's bitter, absolutely bitter. I mean, this is ice rain that's coming down at the moment, and there's a big group of very, very, very hungry cows up there, desperate for us to dump this hay on the ground so they can get stuck in. In winter, farmers need to feed their animals twice a day to ensure they survive until spring. This weather's foul, and whilst it's good for killing off pests and vermin, it can actually be the ruin of a farmer, because ice on the ground means nothing will grow, so no food. And these fellas would get mighty hungry if that was the case. Right, that's it. Walk. Walk. Their big project for the year is to grow a cereal crop. For the last couple of months, it's been on hold, delayed by the cold weather. But if they don't get it in the ground soon, they'll have nothing to harvest next August. The ground is still absolutely frozen solid. It is as hard as rock. And that means that uh, ploughing is going to have to be put off. You know, this is the most stressful part of the year. Let's hope this is the worst of the winter and that by Candlemas, which is in early February, it's all over. Candlemas, the 2nd of February, was seen as a watershed by the Edwardian farmer. There were lots of great little rhymes about the weather at Candlemas time. There's one that goes, if Candlemas be bright and fair, the half of winter's to come and mare. Mare meaning more, doesn't actually rhyme. But what it's saying there is that if it's bright and clear on February, that means you're only halfway through the winter and you've got the second half of the winter to come. So if it rains on Candlemas, winter's over and the weather will improve. If not, winter will have another bite. No, it's just weather law, but you know, there is a bit of truth to it, you know. I'm just starting to get a little bit worried about this now. It's three weeks until Candlemas. All Alex can do is hope this will mark a change in the weather, so he can get a crop in the ground. The farm was built in the 19th century to feed the people of Morwellum Quay, once a booming port and village. Its wealth came from deep underground. In 1844, the largest copper reserves in Europe were discovered here. 
thousands of tons of copper ore were mined, then transported down the quay on this raised railway. It turns sleepy Morwellum Quay into the busiest inland port in England. Here in Morwellum, farmers often supplemented their income by working as miners. Alex and Peter are heading down to the mines along the old railway with experts Rick Stewart and Phil Hurley. One candle. One candle. Issued. And one lump of clay. And a lump of local clay. Right, so we slap that on there. Yep. And this is what they would have used when this mine was sort of in its uh, boom years, yeah? Yeah, I mean, sort of, you know, candles are used from Roman times all right up to sort of 20th century. Right. So, you know, it's good, cheap form of light. So aren't you chaps going to get kitted up with some um, lamps? Well, I mean, sort of, lights? we're going for sort of the state-of-the-art Edwardian technology. Right. What we've got is a carbide lamp. And these started appearing round about sort of 1901, 1902. Oh, OK. Um, so these are bang on the Edwardian. This theory. is cutting-edge Edwardian technology. Right. What we've got, open this thing up, got two chambers. Can I hand you that, please, Phil? This bottom chamber contains the uh, calcium carbide. Right. Uh, so it's going to fill that up. Can you hold that for a moment? Thank you very much. What is calcium carbide? Is it anything like limestone? Yeah, basically. It's a byproduct of, sort of the, the, the limestone industry. Should do it, and we'll put the top compartment on. So this top compartment's the water compartment. Yep. And we open this little needle valve up. Right. That causes water to drip from the top chamber down onto the carbide in the bottom chamber, yeah. which gives off a settling gas. Right. And the gas comes out of this little jet here. Right. We get a flame, which is nicely reflected there. And I suppose the great thing about this lamp is there's nothing to smash on there. Exactly. These things are bomb-proof. They really are wonderful bits of technology. Rick's taking them to explore the George and Charlotte mine, just a hundred yards from their cottage. These mines produce nearly a million tonnes of copper a year, all dug by hand. Miners would spend eight hours a day, six days a week underground, working in these dark, airless conditions. Risk of death was ever present. Falling down a mine shaft was often fatal. Right, this is what metal mining is all about. So you're probably familiar with coal mines, with their sort of horizontal seams of coal. Yeah. Forget that. This is vertical mining. Right. So you've got a vertical ore body coming down through here. Yeah. That's the load. That's what the miners are after. And you can see how they've extracted it, yeah. installing timbers here to stop this wall here, which is known as the hanging wall, yeah. joining this wall here, which is known as the foot wall. As the miners dug ever deeper, there was another problem to overcome. Flooding. Wow. This is a pretty big water wheel. There's yeah, the 18 foot diameter, which, as these things go, is a small one. Wow. I mean, what is it doing? Driving pumps. Well, Basically, we've got four more levels below us. Right. They're below river level, yep. Which is why we need to pump them. So it's pumping water. Pumping water, yeah. So it's bringing water from outside the mine. in to power the wheel exactly. to pump the water out. Inside, out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but pumping water from the mines was costly. So extracting the copper ore got more and more expensive. Well, this mine closed in 1869. I mean, in the 1860s, uh, you started getting a lot of foreign imports coming in from North America and South Australia. Yeah. A lot of the more marginal mines, like this one, closed. Uh, and basically, they just couldn't compete. And those very, very small margins they were making just disappeared. Large-scale, more efficient mines in North America and South Australia spelt the end for the copper mines of Devon and Cornwall. But there were ways farmers here could still make money from the mines. Oh. Woo. Here we are. Rick and Phil are keen to try out a long-lost process. Is this water just coming straight out of the mine, is it? Yeah, this is flowing down 
wrote through a lot of the old working areas of the mine. Should have soaked lots of copper up from the surrounding rocks. Right. We want to try and get the copper out of the water so that it's something that we can make money from. The Edwardians had an ingeniously simple way of extracting this copper. The first job is to install a precipitation tank to capture water from the mine. Poor Phil. Poor Phil. <laughs> Phil is cur currently like waist deep in muddied water. <laughs> Trying to organise a water flow. Here he comes. Oh, 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 I can see it! We have water. Hooray! Dribbly, dribbly, dribbly. dribbly. Phil places rusty pieces of iron in the tank. Now, Phil, I'm no scientist, so you're going to have to talk me through the very basic chemical reaction that's taking place here. Well, because there's copper in the water that's yep. coming out of the mine, that copper is going to change places with the iron oxide, the rust that's on the surface of the metal. Right. So you're going to end up with this metal coated with copper, and the rust is going to come out into the water. Simple as that, yeah. It doesn't stick on very tight. Right. It can just be scraped off. Wow. Well, let's right. carry on filling this Have up. So is there much of this going on then? Yeah, it's a fairly common, it's a very, fairly common process. I mean, you, know, yeah. you have small groups of guys doing just this sort of thing. I mean, yeah. if there was sort of copper there to be had, they would have it. It's one of those things we've always sort of thought of trying, but never quite got round to. So I say this is as much an experiment for us as it is for you. It, it really is very sort of low-key, low-tech uh, metal recovery. Now they must leave it for a few weeks to let nature take its course. It's February the 2nd, Candlemas. It's raining, so according to the old rhyme, the worst of winter should be well and truly over. And getting the animals through the harsh winter has had its upside. I think because we're handling these guys twice a day, we're starting to build a real bond with them. We're starting to know each other, trust each other, and hopefully, when they go out and be adults in the field, they'll follow the bucket. We won't have to chase them around everywhere. They are so sweet, lovely creatures. Soon it'll be spring and the farm will be teeming with new life. Alex has invited Professor Ronald Hutton, an expert in folklore, to ensure a bountiful harvest in their cider orchard. Very glad to be back. <laughs> Great to see you again. Ruth's daughter Eve has joined them for the ceremony. <laughs> Good problem with your tree here. Yeah, yeah. Like, back in uh, September, October time, we wandered down here, we had a single apple and I think it was on this tree here, one single apple. So we've got some real problems with our orchard. OK. This tree here is your team leader. You encourage it and it gets the rest working. We fix him, we fix the lot. Yep. But how would you go about doing that traditionally, then? You've got to wassail it. Now, wassailing means singing to your trees or your animals, whatever you raise on your farm, to encourage it to do better in the next year. Right. Wassailing an apple tree is the real wassailing, the basic wassailing. Right. You know, First thing you do is you need a bowl. Oh, hang on, I've got one here. <laughs> Which makes it easier for us all to it drink. It's a sugar bowl, but, you know, I didn't think that would matter too much. It doesn't. <sighs> Very good. Yeah, cold beer cider, isn't it? Mm. Oh. OK, first thing to do is get some bread. Yeah. Halve it. Dips in here to give your cider body. And we put it in the apple tree. And this will make the tree feel good and will make the birds slightly drunk, in which case they'll sing all the more uproariously and make the trees feel good. <laughs> <laughs> and now let's get down to it. Step right. one, out okay. the way. Good apple tree! We wassail thee, that thou mayst bud, and that thou mayst blow, and that thou mayst bear apples and oh. Hats full, caps full, three bushel barrels full. Hurrah! 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 You just scared away evil from it. <laughs> Fixed. And I'll thank you traditionally for being in company like this. So you've made our wassail too, and I'll gladly sing to you. Fortune bless you and bring you a jolly new year. 
fortune bring you a jolly new year. <laughs> Cheers! <laughs> What's ale? Drink, Drink hail! hail. <laughs> What's ale? Drink, Drink hail! hail. Two months ago, freezing conditions put pay to the ploughing. Now the frosts are over, Alex and farmhand Megan Elliott can get the field ready to be sown with a crop. Go on, boys. Turn the it on. Ploughing returns the field to bare earth and also mixes Alex and Peter's lime fertiliser into the soil. It's good, actually, to, to be getting this lime ploughed in. You know, that was such a backbreaker in itself. It's great to actually see the, the damn stuff buried, to be honest. Alex is using the Shires, Tom and Prince, to pull the plough. It's a complete joy to be out here. The horses have really taken to this. You know, if this is a pair of horses that has never ploughed before. And look at them going. Despite the invention of the tractor, there were more working horses in Edwardian Britain than at any time in history. The Edwardian period is without doubt the dawn of the modern age. It's the dawn of the motor car, the aeroplane. For me, it's just amazing that despite all these innovations, farmers were still overwhelmingly using horses to plough because still in that age, they were the best for the job. Whoa. But Alex's joy is short-lived. For about 30 seconds, I felt we were actually on top of this whole arable project. We've hit an enormous stone. Hitting the stone has broken the ploughshare, the blade that cuts the earth. Basically, that means we can't plough anymore, or at least we, if we do, it'll be messy. Until Alex replaces the share, he can't do any more ploughing. And now, and now it's game over. Hey, boy. <laughs> it's mid-February, a time of year when there was little money to be made from the land. So the farmers are relying on other sources of revenue, like mining to see them through. It's a month since the precipitation tank was installed, and so far, no copper has been produced. But Rick and Phil know of another, more immediate way Edwardians made money from abandoned mines. This is a 19th century miner's track. Watch it, it's a wee bit slippy. It's a lot harder with tools. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Peter, we need those tools up here. <laughs> oh. Ah! Stop dragging your feet, man. <sighs> Rick's taking them to a disused mine shaft. At the pit head is a pile of ore abandoned over a century ago. As the ore comes out of the ground, it's uh, tied up with loads of other minerals and things. And the job was to break that ore down with sort of heavy hammers to separate the good copper ore on one hand from the waste rock on the other. So you've dragged us all the way up the side of a very steep slope to come and... Stop whinging. Smack a pile of rocks, basically. Exactly. Uh, what we're doing, we're doing what's known as fossicking. So we're going back over the old discarded material and we're seeing if anything's been left that we can pick up and sell on. This is really scavenging. So. Somewhere in this pile could be your fortunes. But for the inexperienced Fossica, distinguishing between valuable copper and other worthless metals is no easy task. Nice. There we Let's are, see Rick. what we've got. Anything? Yep. You can see it's sort of a brassy bit of mineral there. Yeah. Yep. Now, that could either be copper, yeah. which is good, yep. Or it could be iron pyrite, fool's gold, which has absolutely no economic value at all. 
It's a simple way to test. Give it a scrape and she can see it's scratching the surface of that. Yeah. That tells us that this is actually softer than the steel. Right. right. Which means that's copper. So that's copper. Congratulations, guys. So we found... You found copper. First. You've struck it rich. First time lucky. That's now, tiny, though. That's absolutely tiny. All you tiny. need to do is find me a few tons of that and uh, we're laughing. <laughs> There's quite a bit there. I mean, look at that. We've got a magnifying glass. <laughs> yeah. After a day at the spoil heap, Alex and Peter need to know whether what they're recovering is of decent quality. Ah, oh, good morning. Come Hello, on in. Mr. Chalbers. Its value depends on assessing how much copper it contains. The job that falls to the key's assayer, John Chilvers. So that's the really the bit that we want to test. So yeah, right. what we need to do is what is known as assay this. Right. Uh, and the whole process in here is to try and extract the copper from the copper ore, see what percentage of copper we can get from it, and then we know just how good the, the ore is itself. Right. Assaying was a crucial job, as it determined the percentage of copper in the ore. If it contained less than 5%, it wasn't worth bothering with. First, John weighs out exactly 20 grams of crushed ore. To that, we've got to add some chemicals, which are known as fluxes. Just the same way as you have flux when you're soldering, which allows the metal to run, we add these chemicals to do exactly the same, to allow the metals to separate out from the rock. Right. OK. We can now place the crucible into the furnace. Then we need to put the lid back on the top there. And if we can get the drawer of air underneath the furnace get there whoosh. to get it up to temperature <laughs> because we need to get this above a thousand degrees. Whoa! At this temperature, the copper melts, allowing it to flow out of the rock. Just check that we've got it nice and hot now. touch it but what you can see now is I've got this big lump of stuff here which is called slag yeah I can throw that away right I can okay. then measure my small bead of copper which <laughs> you see is now very very tiny yeah the 20 grams of ore contains just one gram of copper that would be 1 20th okay which is five percent so, and that would be the grade of the copper ore. Right. And because there then was a standard price for copper ore, mm. then I would sell it on the basis of 5%. By the Edwardian age, the new electrical industry was demanding more and more copper for wiring. Most of this was imported, but scavenging spoil heaps for copper ore was still a worthwhile, if exhausting, sideline. Pub. 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 It's late February. Alex has repaired the ploughshare and finally finished ploughing the field back to bare earth. But before he can sow the cereal crop, there's one more job to do. Harrowing to prepare the soil's tilth. And the till is essentially the friability, the crumbliness of the soil, so that you can sow into it. If you get it too shallow, and you'll have the birds in there, you'll have all sorts of creatures getting into it, and it'll weather away, the wind will just blow the top off. If you get it too deep, of course, the seeds won't germinate and they won't come through. This crop is crucial to their success, so they've called on local expertise. Mr. Francis Mudge's family have grown crops here in Devon for generations. Massive relief to have Mr. Mudge here to uh, give us a few pointers and hopefully we'll get the horses going straight line, get the crop drilled into the ground. What do you think, Francis? Yeah, yeah, it's looking all right, isn't it? it, it you, you've got a fair tilt here. If you can't bury your, your toe in it, it's, it's not that good um, tail in the corn. It wouldn't be buried then, it would be on top, but we've got a good tail here. Cool. OK. With Mr Mudge's seal of approval, it's time to sow the crop. 
In Edwardian Britain, wheat was no longer profitable because of cheap foreign imports. So they grew other cereals instead. Mr. Mudge recommends a favourite among Devon's Edwardian farmers, oats. Everything was done by ore, so one, no, no tractors back in those days were very little. So they, they, they grew oats uh, as a main crop to feed their horses on. So they're the fuel that is powering the kind of the, the horses, which are really That's a right, form of yeah. transport and machinery of the day. Oats was the main crop for that reason, really, for the, keep keep on it, keep your horses going, and because they've done all the hard work they did. The oats will be sown using a state-of-the-art Edwardian seed drill. I feel like the Ben Hur of the agricultural world. Just keeping my eye on all of the filters, just to make sure that all of these are in working order and they're all dropping seed. All good, all fairly regular, all working. That's fantastic. By the Edwardian period, the bottom had truly dropped out of the market for wheat to make bread and for the home market. Wheat was being imported from all over the world. Um, and British farmers just couldn't compete, so they had to turn to another crop that they could make money from. And oats proved the answer. With an enormous number of horses in the cities and towns, there's a viable marketplace. Right, out of gear. Finally, they have their cash crop in the ground. Down at the mine, the precipitation tank has been left to do its work. But after six weeks, has it produced any copper? Finding out. Can you see a future in copper for us, Peter? I think we might have been lucky. Oh, wow. That's rather good, isn't it? That's very good. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, like copper. It is copper plating. It's copper right plating. Right in that corner. Yeah. Yeah. Right in that corner there, look. Isn't that beautiful? That is. All this is uh, deposited copper. That's amazing, Rick. That really is I amazing. I must say I'm exceptionally pleased with this. Well, I always have faith in you, Rick. <laughs> Never doubted you. Never doubted That's doubted what I like you. to hear. <laughs> so we just scrape this off, do we? We just scrape this off. Yeah. And you keep scraping, and scraping, and scraping. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it goes. I'm slightly concerned about the volume of it, though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wasn't expecting huge copper ingots down here, but, uh, you know, uh, an Edwardian, is he going to make a lot of money out of that? Not out of this one piece, but if you multiply this by sort of 100 to 200 times, mm. and you just keep going back, you know, once a month, yep. just scraping the copper off here, yeah. you know, it'll soon build up. Look after the copper pennies, mm. and the copper pounds oh, will take yeah. care of themselves. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So Rick, this is going to bring a few pennies in, yeah. yeah. But where's the real money to be made in mining down here in the Edwardian period? Well, you've really got two options. One, you can go abroad. Right. If you don't fancy that, Money's been made on that side of the river, down in Cornwall. In Cornwall? In Cornwall. Strange place. <laughs> <laughs> Across the river in Cornwall, there was still money to be made from mining. Not copper, but tin. Tin was an important metal to the Edwardians, used in the canning of food, for solder, and as an alloy in pewter, brass and bronze. But if Alex and Peter are to become tin miners, they'll need the tools of the trade, picks and drills. Morwellum's blacksmith, Simon Summers, is responsible for maintaining these tools. The tools would break, get bent, and the picks would get blunt so quickly, you know, with so many men working down there, so it'd be a full-time, full-on job for a blacksmith, just sharpening and hardening. OK, we're ready there now. The first job is to sharpen the pick. Quick clean on the end.
that I'm not going to forge it any more than that now. Finish the rest off with the rasp. The tip of the pick is now sharp, but it'll be blunt again in no time unless it's hardened, a process that required incredible precision. We're just going to put the tip in the fire because that's the only bit that we want hot. Okay. We're just going to quench the tip just there and keep that heat up here. That's our reservoir of heat. Simon cools the tip to monitor the amount of heat that flows back into it. Then we're going to quickly come up onto the anvil and then we wait for that reservoir of heat that you can see there to travel up. As the heat travels back to the tip, it changes colour, and the colour tells the blacksmith how hard the metal is going to be. Those colours have their different uses, um, and when we're cutting hot steel, we look for a blue on the cutting edge, and uh, when we're cutting wood, say for instance an axe or a bill hook, we're looking for purple on the cutting edge. And uh, with this actual pick, it's going to be actually used for cutting stone, we're looking for a yellow on the tip. Now you can see a blue purple coming up down here, but our bright yellow is just heading to the end, so we just quench it. Rapidly cooling the tip of the required colour hardens it. Just see on the tip we've got our yellow, our bright yellow, and then it comes back into like a, a bronzy colour. Now that tip is hardened, ready for mining. All we need now is a handle. Miners spent eight hours a day underground, so they'd take a meal with them, in the form of a pasty. Local ladies Sue, Iris and Julie have come to help Ruth make a batch for the boys. Not that critical, really, is it, what you put inside a pasty? No, it's more or less what you've got. You know, what you can afford, I suppose. Yeah, so... Turnip. Turnip and onion. Actually, I'm going to put the potato in first. You are going to put the potato in yeah. first. You chip it. You don't dice it. It must be chipped. <laughs> chipped. You know what you mean by chipped, don't yes, you? Yes, <laughs> you don't. <laughs> it's sliced, a form of slicing. Yeah. In small pieces. Very small. Yeah, and then it just cooks better. Yeah. Cooks through quick at the same That's time right. as everything else. Yeah. And then we're on to our lovely beef skirt. Quite a lot of food in one pastry. Now I can see where you say a complete meal. Bit of seasoning, and it's over, and crimp. So, turn, turn like a triangle. Yeah. Flatten this as you go. I see. And this is the bit we call the crimp. That's right. That's the crimp. And then. That looks lovely. <laughs> that looks really nice. And of course, when they finish the pasty, they used to throw the pastry away. Just well, the throw last it. Little bits the last, holding. yeah, the pastry crust. So once they finished eating it, they throw it to the knockers. What the heck are knockers? <laughs> <laughs> you know, in my world, knockers are something the little, the little, that a woman has. The little, <laughs> the little folk that lived down the mines had to keep them happy. Really? Yeah. We're talking. <laughs> People really believe it, though. Yeah, yes. yeah, they did. Yeah. They were very superstitious back then. Yes. Yeah. Very so superstitious. <laughs> Fabulous. Right, well, let's get sorted. We've got 30 more to make. <laughs> Hello, Peter. Hi, Simon. How are you? All right. I'm all right, thank you very much, yeah. So this looks it's unrecognisable. That's the tool I gave you. Uh, yeah, well, we've, it's, it's been serviced, basically. You know, right. like, uh, we've, we've given it a really good clean-up. And you've, you've sharpened our drill bit as well, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, I have, yeah. Tom, would you like to bring the drill bit over? Yeah. There, what we've done here is we've um, hardened the end. You can see that yellow straw colour yeah. right on the tip there for cutting stones. Hit it, twist it. Tough work. Yeah, well, good luck with that. Thank you very much. Are you going to be carrying these on your own? Yeah, basically, I got to pick up the tools, because they're heavy, and now it's got to pick up the pasties. Because if I picked up the pasties, I might have eaten them on the way home. <laughs> Cheerio, then. See you later. There's a real hive of industry in here, Ruth. <laughs> Looking good, don't they? In there. Straight in. Pasty. 
Oh, oh, oh. oh, and by the way, yep. send your crusts down to the knockers. My, my crusts down to the knockers? Should I be asking what that means? Don't eat the crust. You Don't. must always throw them to the knockers down the mine to keep, them happy. People, to keep them happy. Right, the knockers. <laughs> Have you not been drinking? <laughs> Equipped with tools and pasties, it's time for the miners to cross the river into Cornwall. Hello, chaps. How are you? Hi. All right. Good to see you, Joshua. Yeah, all right. How are you? Oh, very good. They're being taken across by their old friend, Joshua Preston. So what's it been like up here? Because I haven't seen you lads for two or three months, I don't think. Well, it's been cold, wet and miserable. Yeah, it's been a harsh winter so far. But if you're going underground, of course, you'll be nice and snug there. These yeah. old boys will tell you, look. Yeah, it's nice and warm. If it's not warm, we'll soon get you warm. Right. <laughs> it's a swing your pick or two. So you've got some work lined up for us. Oh, yeah. All along the river, there's evidence of the valley's industrial heritage. It's amazing. A sort of lost industrial landscape, isn't it? In the Edwardian era, these lime kilns would have worked around the clock. Now, they're eerily deserted. Right. Wonderful. There you go. Picks. Drill. Carbide lamps. Thank you very much. Boys, all the best. Fred and I can get back <laughs> to a little bit of salmon we've had in now and, and see if we can earn a little bob or two. Thank you very much. Oh, you. You. Lead on, Rick. Lead on. Welcome to Cornwall, Peter. <laughs> I'm scared. It's a terrifying place, it really is. Ricks brought them to the King Edward mine in Camborne, Cornwall. Virtually unchanged for over a century. This plant, equipped with the latest in Edwardian technology, once extracted the metal from tin ore. First, though, they must head deep underground to mine the ore and learn the lost skills of the Edwardian miner. The techniques we're going to be using now mm. are classic sort of 19th century techniques, sort of right. hand drilling, candles. I think it's important that you guys try it, yeah. just yeah. to know sort of how hard it actually was. You're going to use your lovely new picks then to uh, yeah, make our hold? Re, uh, where should we go? Well, looks good here. Edwardians used dynamite to blast the tin ore from the rock, but first holes had to be drilled to put the charges in, by hand. What sort of speed are we looking for here, Rick? Well, if you can put in whew, about a three-foot hole in a couple of hours, <laughs> I'll be impressed. Three foot? Right, OK. Having said that, I mean, these guys were doing this competitively as well. So, they'd, you know, weekends, yeah. they might competitively drill. Um, the record stands at about 13 minutes for six inches. 13 in, minutes for six inches. And that's in granite, which is harder than this. So they spend six days a week working at it, and then Sunday... Exactly. Let's have a competition, guys. Right, well, so Phil and I, we're off. Uh, we'll see you later. See you well, later. Okay, then, right. So if I'm going to go in there... Okay. Missed it completely. Just pulled up short of your shoulder right there, Peter. Well, that's the reason why I look this way, because I, I was just oblivious. <laughs> OK, where are we at then, Peter? Well, where I think we started making initial progress, now, we're, we're getting there, but at a slightly slower rate. When you just think about the enormity of the hillsides around here. Yeah. Just the size of the hills, the size of the cave we're in, and the size of the hole we've just made in the time. Life is not easy down the mine. No, I think we've learnt one thing. <laughs> Never grumble about farming again. <laughs> yeah. They're going to be back soon. They are, they are going to be back soon. They want to see. Let's go for it. Three. All oh, feet. That work. Yeah. 
While the boys are mining, Ruth's going to try a hand at another of Devon's lost Edwardian industries, lace making. Hello, Ruth. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Do come in. Thank you very much. Pat Perryman has been making Honiton lace for over 40 years. You'd have a group of people, maybe together, but sometimes in their own homes, of course. And one lady would make all the leaves, one would make all the certain flowers. But the more experienced ladies would collect together the pieces and they would do the assembly and join them together. The Devon town of Honiton is world famous for its intricate, delicate and beautiful lace. Once half the inhabitants of East Devon were lace makers. You know, a nice bit of tension on this bobbin and... But its complexity made it incredibly labour intensive. You're talking um, nine to ten hours for a square inch, taking the easy with the harder stitches. Really? Yes, yeah, sure. So a cuff like that, which isn't very a big, isn't a big thing. No. That's just one cuff on a yeah, blouse. Exactly. One, two, three, four, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. What? Yeah. Two hundred? Yeah. Two hundred and fifty yeah. hours? Yeah. Gracious! I mean, that is meant to be one cuff on a blouse, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know, if you charge £10 an hour, and it, that's, that's right. <laughs> £2,000, £2,500 well, £2, £2, so for yeah. one cuff. But the, le the um, husbands of the day, of course, bought their wives the lace instead of jewellery. So the posher your lace, the more wealthy you were. In the Edwardian age, every young girl in the Devon village of Honiton would have been taught the art of lace making. You take this pair and the next pair. So that goes back yeah. over one. Yes, and those two, two exactly. There. Move that pair fractionally out of your way to remind you. This craft goes back to the 16th century. It involves weaving thread wound onto bobbins around pins pushed into a template. Always right bobbin over left, never any different. One, two, three. I often say if you can count to three, you can do it. Now you're going to make what we call your edge stitch. I'll show you for the very first time. Next time you'll be able to do it. One, two, three. You say this pair stays behind and this pair is going to travel back to the other side. Don't turn your pillow. Number two goes first. It's lifetime's work, really. <laughs> it's becoming clear that this isn't a craft learned in an afternoon. They would sit for eight to 12 hours a day. Yeah, well, you hear of lace schools, don't you, with tiny little children? Yeah, five years, five years old, eight really. in the morning till eight at night. Jeez. When the Education Act came in in 1870, the government said all children must go to school, but in Holland it didn't happen until 1903. Really? This industry defied. actually held up children's education all those years? Yes. Prevented children getting yes. schooling? Because the parents <gasps> said, my Mary must make lace. We can't That's afford for her to go to school. But in 1903, Devon County stepped in, and it was a half a day. It was a compromise. The children did the three hours in the morning and lace in the afternoon. And then in about 1960, it was an after-school activity. So it was within the school day <laughs> up until 1960. I know until we're out of our sort of time, yeah, but, yeah. I am really quite shocked by that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm watching you. <laughs> Because you won't earn your money if you're... I'm never going to earn any money at this rate. If you're um, not practising. Right. You there yet? No, no one here. Pretty exhausted, to be honest. I'm tired. Uh, well, fortunately, it helps at hand. Uh, during the Edwardian period, you started getting sort of increased mechanisation in mining. So, for example, this is got a compressed air rock drill. So this <laughs> does what you're doing yeah. using compressed air. The compressed air rock drill was a British invention that came into its own in the Edwardian age. A steam engine outside the mine compresses the air, which is then carried in pipes down to the rock face. In theory, this should have made life easier for the Edwardian miner. In practice, there was a downside. Pre-First World War, none of these drills had any form of dust suppression. Right. So, you're going to end up breathing in a lot of dust. Right, OK then. So, if you're drilling into material like quartz and things like that, you're going to have a very, very short lifespan. But they earned themselves a really gruesome nickname. What? These early unsuppressed drills are known as widow makers. The widow maker? Yeah. So we're working with the widow maker? We are working with the widow maker. <laughs> Uh, that's it. 
This is the most nervous I've been for anything we've ever done. I'm holding my hands on the wheel <laughs> bit here. <laughs> okay. Uh, coming in. This drills deeper in a minute than a hand drill can in an hour. There you have it, gentlemen. Bring back hand drilling. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and this kept mining going into the Edwardian period. Right. And people were able to open up ore deposits a lot faster and were also able to exploit them faster. So this, this is basically the saviour of uh, West of England mining. Right. <sighs> Do you know what you're going to do next? <laughs> I'm lost it completely. <laughs> it's a pair you're going to twist through. Oh, right, yeah, 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 yeah. OK. Back at Morwellum, things are not going well for Ruth. I mean, I, there's so many things about this I find <laughs> really quite sort of... This is why it's a long-term learning, learning process. So I think yeah. you might need to come at least once a week for about a year. Is it? That's how long to learn days. your basic basics. Oh. Yeah, I know. So there's absolutely no chance of me as an Edwardian adult with all these other sort of... With four or five children and husbands. And there's no way you could take up lace making and actually make some pin money. Not really. I don't think this is the cottage industry I should be relying on to pay the rent. <laughs> Maybe just for relaxation. <laughs> By the Edwardian period, cottage industries like lace making were dying out. Leaving many women with no income of their own. Expensive handmade lace just couldn't compete with the cheap factory made variety. But Ruth's discovered another way Edwardians made money from the Honiton lace industry. It was apparently extremely common to send your lace out to specialist cleaners. And many of these were just women in their own homes who were just known to be good at it. Oh, gosh. Gosh, I've been trusted with a really great piece here. Hunnerton lace is extremely delicate, and if washed loose in water, it would distort and be ruined. I'm just going to drop that in nice and flat, and I want that to soak. So lace cleaners would carefully wrap it into a linen parcel. Ooh, There is a bit of a greyness in the water, so obviously I'm shifting something. Now the lace must be dried. Certainly the parcel business has worked. Look how nice and flat and well looked after it is. The reason for this process is to sort of set it back into a perfect shape um, so that when it comes off here, it will hold absolutely pristine. I mean, this may seem like a huge amount of work to wash something, but I've been counting these motifs and working it out. This has got to be, if one person did it, this is over a year's worth of work in this piece of lace. Over a year. So, if you think about that in modern wages, jeepers. I am so scared of getting this wrong. <laughs> if I damage this. Gosh. Let's lower her off. Down in the tin mine, the holes are drilled. Rick's demonstrating how Edwardians would have blasted the rock from the face using dynamite. First thing we need is a couple of feet of fuse. Can you cut me about a two foot length of that? Now, this is what the Edwardians would have called safety fuse. Right. And that gives you a timed burn. Right. Right. So, in a minute, that stuff should burn about two feet. So I'll give us a minute to get out of here. A minute? A minute. Is that it? That's plenty of time. Right, next thing to do is uh, crimp on a detonator. This detonator contains an explosive called fulminate of mercury. So, so what was that called? Fulminate of mercury. Fulminate of mercury. Mercury, yep. We'll be taking notes here. Oh, yeah. And next stage is the dynamite itself. Charge into that hole like that. Push it, down. Push it down to the bottom of the shot hole. Yeah. Right. What we need now is some clay. Uh, plenty of that. Some more hat. 
This basically stops the charge just blowing out. To get, gone. to get the explosion sort of getting out into the rock, we yep. need to block up the hole. Ready for firing? I suggest you guys make yourselves scarce. Right, we will do. This is uh, nice knowing you. Firing! The miners have earned themselves a spot of lunch. Ooh, this is a nice little comfy spot, Rick. Oh, yes. Legend has it that the crust was used as a handle to protect the pasty from dirty hands. But Rick's having none of it. And the best way to do it is just get a bag or a rag or something, just wrap it around it. Keeps it nice and clean, and then you can eat the whole thing quite happily. Well, with none of this nonsense about throwing your crust away or anything. So no, no throwing the uh, crust to the uh, knockers then? Oh no, oh no, too good to waste. Right chaps, so I think it's back to work for us. The team are taking their blasted rock to the King Edward Mines processing plant to extract the tin. First it's assessed to see how much tin it contains. It's a job for the assayer, Tony Clark. I can see you're enjoying that, Peter. <laughs> Very much so. As the assayer, everyone's looking at you to be as fair as possible yep. in determining the, the, the tin content. That's of right, because the tin content of this determines how much you get paid for the amount of ore that you've brought up. Did the guy who did this job, did he ever diddle the miners? No. In other, well, put it this way, the bias was always slightly in favour of the management. Yes. And are you paid by the management? I am. Right, OK. <laughs> Start amazing. <laughs> to assess the powdered rock, Tony uses water and a vanning shovel. We now manipulate it and throw the heavy tin ore up the shovel. The heavier particles respond more, right. so they go further up the shovel. Right. Yeah, you see it move up there? That's the tin in your ores, so there's plenty in there. It's well worth treating. But don't forget, you would have had to pay for your candles, mm -hmm. blasting powder. Right. All costs prior to stamping, you're responsible for. Right. We could actually find ourselves in debt. You could, actually, yeah. Tony's analysis shows that their rock contains 3% tin, enough to make extracting the metal worthwhile. So the team are delivering their consignment to plant manager Nigel McDonald for processing. Hello there. I'm Alex. How do you do, Alex? I'm Peter. Hello, Peter. Breaking up the rock was a laborious job done by women, known as bal maidens. At the turn of the 19th century, we would have had probably 20 to 30 bal maidens working on this cobbing floor behind us. Right, so all around here, yeah? All around here, and they would be breaking up the large rocks in order to be able to feed them to the processing plant. Right, oh, okay. And hand sorting all of the good material from the bad. Yep, OK. Once it's been broken up, machinery takes care of the rest. Heavy stamps turn the rock into powder, which is then filtered, allowing the tin granules to be separated using this shaking table. The King Edward mine once processed thousands of tons of rock a year. Now it's the only surviving example of an Edwardian processing plant. Ruth's come to see the machines that replaced many local workers. You know, quite obviously, a really modern machine for, say, 1905. Yes. And this is absolutely the cutting edge, isn't yes, it? Yes, that's right. So how many people is this replacing? This is probably replacing four or five people. Five jobs gone. You're a fab machine, but, you know, <laughs> that's a lot of money not coming into families, isn't it? Exactly. And those people would probably have been women, wouldn't they? Yes. Young women, mostly. Young, young women and boys. Bal maidens. But, yeah, they, they, it would be the bal maidens. <laughs> who would be mothers and daughters of the miners who were underground and the young boys 
before they were old enough to actually go underground. They probably wouldn't go underground much before the ages of 11, 12. Yeah. It's completely changing the whole work ethic of the mining industry. And the whole social they, sort And the of... social structure that goes around that. The process is complete. The miners came into the factory with rock containing 3% tin. But what have they produced? So what percentage is that now? Probably about sort of 60 to 65 percent. And you can see it's rather reluctant to move around in the water, which indicates that it's quite heavy and quite good grade, which can be smelted to produce the tin metal. Yeah, so that's, wow. that's what all the work's been worth. <laughs> Tin mining was still big business in Cornwall well into the 20th century. The last mine closed in 1998. After a hard day's work, there's a chance to reflect. Bear in mind that you know, you're our trainees, so Phil and I are taking the lion's share of what we've earned. <laughs> Which isn't much. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds almost as lucrative as lace making. <laughs> I think we'll stick to the farming. But you know, you've got to bear in mind this was an industry that was dying. Mm. So if you guys wanted to make a living out of it, you know, you'd probably have to sort of supplement it, say, with your farming. Yeah. Or go abroad. That's your option, yeah. basically. So and you're getting huge you know, groups of sort of Cornish miners, you know, just going to all the four corners of the earth. The skills that built all these, you know, New World mining camps, South Australia, North America, and South Africa, you know, that came from Cornwall. I mean, there's a saying, you know, the definition of a mine is a hole in the ground with a Cornishman at the bottom of it, <laughs> and that's not far from the truth. You know. I have to say, mining has been absolutely fascinating. I didn't realise there was so much history mm. concealed under these hills. Yep. It's been a real adventure for us. Excellent. So, here's to mines and miners. Cheers. Oh, the farmers work around the fields, their legs tied up with hay. And the miners, they work underground and never miss a day. Oh, a mining we will go, boys, a mining we will go. With picks and shovels in our hands, a mining we will go. We all live in the engine house and make the best of that. Oh, a mining we will go, boys, a mining we will go. With picks and shovels in our hands, a mining we will go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next time on Edwardian Farm. One single day in the life of the Edwardian farmer. From first thing in the morning... My lungs are absolutely bursting. ..through the day... ..and into the night. Day in the life of an Edwardian farmhouse. Cheers. Cheers. history of the greatest empire the world has ever known next on BBC Two, while on BBC Four, Al Murray gets to grips with more art and culture on his German adventure. <laughs>